The word Genesis means origin or new beginnings, beginnings. When something is just starting or at its beginning, it often has to overcome obstacles in order to succeed, in order to win. For example, the caterpillar that is wound up in a cocoon when the time has come and the transformation has taken place inside that protective shell, there has to be a, a push, there has to be a struggle, there has to be a fight to get out of that. And during the fight, you know what happens. The reason you never cut the end of a cocoon off and pull out the butterfly is because you stun its growth, you tarnish its beauty. It is in the fight that all of the colorful dye goes down through the wings of the butterfly. If you cut that fight short, if you cut that struggle short, if you remove the obstacle from that butterfly, it will come out uh, muted, it will come out deformed, it will come out without its color and without its splendor. It is in the fight that the beauty comes. Don't ever forget that. And in the Genesis, in the starting, or the starting over of many things, there has to be a fight to get to where we want to be. We find that in the book of Genesis. In the fall, we had two messages from Genesis, two series of messages. The patriarchs and all of those were in overcoming obstacles. And then we went into Joseph's life. And today we'll talk about Joseph for one message. But the next few messages that we'll have are a series entitled, God Saves His Chosen Nation. The life that you and I live, it's hard. No one can argue that. It is not fair. Things don't always go as planned. Life is not fair. I, I, I think I learned this early on in life, not because of any real difficulty or hardship, just by explanation. <laughs> His name was Mr. Hill. In the seventh grade at Metropolitan Dixon County Junior High on College Street, I believe, about 28 or 30 seventh graders got to take algebra, and the rest of the algebra classes were made of eighth graders, so we were kind of one year ahead. And when the first test came up, we looked on that test sitting there in his class and Mr. Hill administering the test. We found out as we looked over that test that there were many topics in algebra, many problems in algebra on that test that we had not covered in class. Yes, they were in the book that we had before us, but never covered on the board or explained in class. And we began to protest, as seventh graders only can do, Mr. Hill, this is not fair. To which Mr. Hill responded, the fair comes in September. I don't know where you grew up. I grew up in a redneck country community called Dixon County, just west of Nashville. We actually got a day or two off every September from school. I mean, they closed school so that we could go and waste our money at the fair and at the tractor pool and all that stuff. He said the fair comes in September. That, that is an explanation. Ladies and gentlemen, life is not fair. You will face hardship, hurt, setbacks, struggles. Circumstances change. They don't always go as planned. People lose their job. We make poor decisions. And as a result, life hurts. No one's exempt from hurt, hardship, or heartache. Not one of us. If you haven't experienced it, you just haven't lived long enough yet. You will. And that's not a downer. That's just reality. And then how do we face that? In Genesis 15, Abraham receives this promise from God. And the promise is, look up at the starry sky. Your descendants will be as many as the scars are in the heavens, or the sand on the shore. You will be the father of many nations. In other words, you can't count all the peoples I'm going to give to your lineage. And then you go to Genesis 41, about 25 chapters later, here you find something strange. Abraham had this promise, and now a couple generations later, a man named Jacob, whose name has changed to Israel, has some sons, and they have some wives, and they have some kids, and there's about 70 of them in Canaan now, but it's a bad time. The whole world at that area is under famine, from Egypt all the way north into Canaan. And now this, this 
lineage of Israel, the nation who's supposed to have so many people you can't count them like the stars, they're about to die of starvation because of the famine. And yet down in Egypt, there's one younger brother who's grown up and God, through circumstance and situation, struggle and hardship, has risen him up to second in command. And all this time, he's been storing up during the seven years of plenty and the famine hits and they've got tons and tons and tons of grain. You've got a starving nation and one man that God uses to begin the salvation process to this family, this nation. Joseph is a classic example of a person who suffered greatly, had to overcome hardships and heartaches. He never wrote a book that we know of. We know he didn't write a Bible book. He never slew a giant like David. He did interpret some dreams, but never worked a miracle as raising the dead or healing the lame. And yet, all through Genesis, we hear about this man. All he ever did was win. All he ever did was succeed. No matter how you shook him up and tossed him about, he would land on his feet and succeed. Even amidst his setbacks. Today's message title is Choose to Win. Even when everything goes wrong. Listen to this verse about Joseph in the 39th chapter. I hope you have your Bibles, either electronic copy or hard copy. I've got both with me at the pulpit. Genesis 39, 23. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Joseph won. He succeeded in whatever he did. Now, what made Joseph so great? Why did he always land on his feet? Why did he succeed and win at every turn, even amidst the crisis that he faced or crises? The answer is... Because he succeeded in spite of his circumstances, he did not let his circumstances determine who he was or where he was going or what he would do. What can we learn from Joseph to help us succeed, to help us win, even when we face the hurt and hardship and heartaches of life? What can we learn? Let's pray and then we'll study that. God, thank you today that you have met us here in power through our worship. God, that you have been speaking to us in this act of praise and worship as Pastor Chip has so ably led us. God, now, as we get into your word, speak even further, God. Teach our hearts. May our minds be attentive and our spirits open as you teach us, Lord, from your word. Holy Spirit, continue to fill me fresh even in this moment. I beg you. I need you. I surrender my mind and my mouth to you, Lord. Speak to my spirit, my mind, and through my mouth. Lord, I love you and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Jacob and 70 of his family, this small, struggling nation, beginning to starve. And yet Joseph has tons of grain stored in the south. The salvation of one small nation of Israel started in one man named Joseph who had been wrongly treated much of his young life. He had... He'd spent his life overcoming hurt and hardship, but he just kept on winning. Joseph refused to quit. He refused to give up. And the result is many people were blessed and saved, starting with his own family. And from there, all of Egypt. You understand how crucial this is. <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes we say, oh yeah, that's great. You know, if Joseph doesn't save Israel, you and I don't have a Savior. Because from Israel, down through the lineage of King David, down through the lineage of Mary the mother, we have our Savior Jesus Christ. This is a big deal. One man, one woman, one student can make a huge difference if we want, if we want to win. If we want our family to win and overcome, we must overcome. What can we learn from Joseph? A few simple thoughts. One, keep your focus on God. Often in my life, when hurt or hardship comes my way, I begin to ask this question, Lord, why me? And I ask this question because, you know, give or take, I've been okay. You know, I've been a, I've been a pretty good pastor, made some mistakes, but for the most part, I'm okay. I've been a decent husband. You know, I, I do what my wife tells me 68% of the time. 
Why me, Lord? Why should I have a hardship? Why should I struggle? Why should me or my family be in pain? Why well, I've surrendered to the ministry, God. And then there begins a negotiation of because I'm, because I'm in the ministry. Or even if I wasn't, if I was like you, good Christians. Why, why God, should I suffer? But then I'm learning, ladies and gentlemen, that perhaps that's the wrong question. Maybe a better question is, Lord, why not me? I'm no better than anybody else. God, you don't love me any more or any less than anybody else on this whole planet. You love everybody the same with a perfect love. God, why not me? And then maybe if I really got mature, if I really got brave, if I really had some courage, maybe I'd ask this question. God, why not use me? God, why not encourage me? Why not mature me? God, why not grow me? Why not help me be a shining light even in the darkest pit that others might know you through my suffering? Boy, that sounds a little bit, or maybe a lot a bit, like Jesus. Had Jesus bypassed his suffering, we'd all be headed for an eternal hell. Instead of asking, Lord, why me? Maybe I should say, Lord, why not me? And what can I learn? And how can I grow in this struggle? We're going to have struggles. So what do I do with them? And how do I respond to them? And how do I live through them? How does a person focus on God? It's just paramount. And we'll spend most of our time here. And then we'll give you some other thoughts. How, how do we focus on God? One, by remembering His presence. Genesis 39, if you have your Bibles, 23, I read that. If you've got Genesis, say, got it. Thank you. 39, 23. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Joseph was not alone in his pit. Joseph was not alone in his prison. Joseph was not alone in the dry well. Joseph was not alone in the dark prison cell. He was absolutely not alone. You are not alone in your hardship, your hurt, your heartache. You're not alone. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to, hear, I want to tell you today that God, His Son, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the triune God you love and serve, He cares deeply about you. And and. The care that God has for you and the presence of God with you, if you're his child, is not determined by how you feel. You understand that? My feelings or lack thereof do not determine God's presence in my life or in yours. My feelings fluctuate daily. The fact that God is with me is based on his word and his statement. Lord, I'm with you always. I'll never ab- abandon you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you alone. That promises all throughout Scripture. Listen, if we based our relationship with God by feelings, we're in trouble because feelings do this. We base it on the fact of God's love for us, his sacrifice he's already made, and the faith that he gives us toward him. Today, we need to all acknowledge that we have the presence of God with us and even at times we don't feel it. Now, I love feelings. I absolutely love I, I would say I'm as Pentecostal as any Baptist you've ever met. Amen. Thank you, brother. Bapticostal. I love it when the presence of God is so strong that we can, we can feel him and we have spiritual goosebump and the hair on the back of our neck stands up. It is glorious. But God is no less presence when I feel nothing than when I feel everything. God is, God's presence is not based on how I feel or how you feel. God's presence is based on the fact that he stated and he loves you and he says, I am with you. Tell yourself right now. Tell yourself out loud. Say it out loud. I am not alone. God is with me. Now, in, in case you don't believe yourself, even after you say, in case you don't, turn to your neighbor, somebody beside you, and say, you are not alone. God is with you. Focus on God by remembering His presence even in the dark times of life. Now, here's a second thought. Not only do we need to remember His presence, we need to realize God's purpose. Genesis 50, turn toward the end of Genesis if you've got your hard copy or in your electronic copy. Just scroll down or flip over. Genesis 50, 20. When you got Genesis 50, say, got it. Thanks. Verse 20. You, Joseph speaking to his brothers toward the end of this book. Joseph speaks to his brothers and he says this. You guys, my brothers, you intended to harm me. But God intended it, that is me being sold into slavery by your cruelty, 
to accomplish what is now being done. That is the salvation of, of my whole family and the nation of Israel and the lineage of, of J. Abraham through Isaac, through all the lineage until Jesus. All of this is coming about because you thought you were harming me, but God was doing it to accomplish what's being done for the salvation, the saving of many lives. The climax of Joseph's stories is when his brothers worry that he, Joseph, will take revenge on them for selling him cruelly into slavery as a teenage boy. And yet Joseph does exactly the opposite of revenge. He realizes that his suffering, listen, his suffering is what prepared him, trained him, educated him, and positioned him to where he was second in Pharaoh's kingdom. You understand that? Joseph had the maturity to say, had I not gone that route, I would never have been in this position to do this work to save my own family. So the next time you find yourself in a pit or a prison, say, Lord, maybe the purpose is bigger than what I know. Maybe this is a training ground for where I'm going in the future and where you're taking me. So many times the purposes of God are being worked out even when we don't know it. And the process is coming through our struggles and suffering. Joseph had a, never would have never been trained had he not been sold to Potiphar. Would have never been trained had he not run the entire prison. He never would have had that opportunity to stand before Pharaoh and interpret dreams had he not first interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. God was working a plan. God was working a purpose. And we don't get to always see the big picture. I've, I've touched on this before, but it's worth, worth touching again. Failure. Falling. Ha, has anybody in this room ever failed or fallen? All right, the rest of you need to repent for prevaricating. Do you know what prevaricating means? Liar, liar. Everybody fails. Failure happens in life because we're a broken people. We don't always make the right decisions. Sometimes we get in a dark place because of what somebody else does. Many times we get in a dark place because of what we do. Most of the time it's probably a combination of both. But failure is a good place for God to get our attention. God can shape us and grow us during our struggles and our hurts, during our failures. Everybody's going to fail. And I've said it before and I've done it before right here, but it's worth saying and illustrating again. It's not a matter of whether you're going to fall or fail. It's how you fall or fail and what you do in the midst. You fall. You fail. I ask you, I beg you, don't get up like this three steps back. When you fall or fail or mess up, you say, God, I'm broken. Help me, heal me, mature me, grow me, help me learn and get up like this. One or two or three steps forward because you're further down the road that God is leading you. Fail forward, not backwards. Third thought, how do we focus on God? By recalling God's promises. When Joseph was just a boy, <clears throat> through dreams, God told him that he was going to be a great leader of many and his life would count for something great. Joseph held on to that promise in his life. That promise gave him hope in an empty well. That promise gave him hope and kept him alive and same in a dark prison cell. That hope of what God had promised kept him going. Now, friends, I don't know. Perhaps God has spoken to you in a dream and given you a promise. And if that's the case, I love it. I'm for it. But maybe some of you haven't had a promise given to you in a dream. Let me tell you, you want a promise from God? Just read the book. Hundreds, if not thousands of promises are right here for your taking. God's love letter to you. I promise never to leave you. I promise to take you to heaven. I promise to bless you when you follow me. I promise to carry you when you can't carry yourself. I promise to walk with you in the dark days. I promise to bring you out. I promise to bring you out of Egypt and bring you into land of promise. I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. That's what God says. Grab hold of God and his promises. Hold on to them. Remember them. 
Because they will walk you through the darkest hours of your life. That's point number one. You're doing good. Just four more. These won't be as long. Point number two. Don't let the past ruin your future. Go from Genesis 50 to Genesis 41. Turn back in your electronic or your paper copy of God's Word. If you got Genesis 41, say, got it. Thanks. Verse 51. Joseph, in prison, married. Then he had children. Look at verse 51. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Joseph was head of Pharaoh's palace when he married and had children. He named his firstborn son Manasseh. Manasseh in Hebrew means God has caused me to forget. Joseph had many troubles, many memories of hurt and heartache. Joseph had been betrayed twice and imprisoned twice by those close to him. Yet rather than live in the past that he cannot erase, or that he cannot change in any way. He chose to forget the past and live in the present and prepare for the future. One of the remarkable traits of Joseph was that he didn't dwell, stay in, wallow in self-pity. Now, every one of us, unless there's some disconnect in our brain, some psychotic mess up, some some short out, every one of us occasionally will... will, <laughs> will some of you are grim your head. Yeah, Tom, there's something messed up in your brain. I see that. <laughs> we all occasionally, for a, for a time, and hopefully a short time, we do, we do feel sorry for ourselves because, man, it hurts. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen or we don't get there. Just don't let yourself get stuck there. Because you're more than a conqueror with Jesus Christ. You're, you're more than a champion. You're a victor, not a victim. And so here we see that Joseph says, I'm going to name my firstborn, a word that will remind me every time I say, Manasseh, pick up your room. Manasseh, do your homework. Manasseh, be on time at the dinner table. Respect your mom. Take off your hat. Put on a shirt. Every time you say Manasseh, Joseph was saying, I'm going to remind myself that God helps me forget that which tried to break me, and I'm going to just hold on to that which blessed me to put me here. Would you have a sanctified lack of memory? Don't let, don't let your past ruin your future. He did not wallow in self-pity. He did not harbor bitterness or seek revenge. See, the devil will attempt to chain you to your past so you can't learn and love in the present, and you cannot hope for a glorious future. Let me say it again in case you missed it. The devil will attempt to chain you to your past so that you can't learn and love in the present and hope for a glorious future. Do not allow the devil to steal your hope of a glorious future. Be productive. Be fruitful in your work wherever you are. Look at verse 52. Verse 52, Genesis 41, the second son he named Ephraim. And that means, in Hebrew, it is because God made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God made me productive. God made me fruitful. Here it is, guys and gals, when we find ourselves in a dark place, for a moment, yes, it's tough. Not, not, not just it's tough for a moment, but for a moment you say, man, I can't do this. And then you know what? You just get up and say, with God's help, I can do this. With God's help, I can do this. It stinks. I hate it. But I'm not going to quit on life. I'm not going to quit on my family. I'm not going to quit on the place where I work. And you know what? That's what Joseph did. He went on. And wherever he was, he did well. Wherever he was, he did his best. His very best. He never allowed hardship or setback to keep him down. Joseph was like cream that rises to the top. He pushed through like a caterpillar, and he did his very best. At several places in life, he could have said, this is just so unfair. It's never going to come about. Those were foolish dreams and promises that God gave me. I quit. And yet he didn't. He excelled. He achieved. Life isn't fair. 
Win anyway with the grace, mercy, strength, and power of God in your life. Win anyway. One of our greatest witnesses, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I I just want to speak to your workplace. One of our greatest witnesses is our work performance. Do you understand that? How is that the case? Let me tell you how that the case is. Is even in the midst of our hardship, you and I ought to do our best to be productive at work. Let me just put it this way real quick. If you are last every quarter in sales, if you are the least productive, if you are the laziest, if you come in late, take a two-hour lunch, and go home early, how in the world, if that is the environment that you create around you in your workplace, how in the world can anybody really value you when you try to tell them, hey, I got something greater than anything to tell you. Jesus Christ will take you to heaven forever. And they say, if I can't even trust you in the material work things of life, how can I trust you in the eternal things of life? You get what I'm saying? Man, you ought to be the top salesman, or at least the best you can be. The Bible clearly says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You know how much easier it is when you're pulling your weight, when you're doing your work, when you're excelling even in the dark times? Man, some lady, some guy can admire knowing the hardship you're in, and yet you're still working a good work at work. I'm telling you, that's a good opportunity to bear witness for Christ. Sometimes you just have to stay with it. It's not easy. This is not no way to downplay your pain or mine. It is hard. Life is hard, man. It stinks at times. But you can't give up. You got to keep working. You got to keep swimming. You got to keep trying. I first read this, what I'm about to share with you, probably 35 years ago. And there are multiple versions. Feel free to look it up. But I'll give you the version that I chose. Two frogs. Two frogs fell into a deep cream bowl. One was an optimistic soul, but the other took a gloomy view. We shall drown, he cried, without more ado. So with a last despairing cry, he flung up his legs and said, Goodbye. Said the frog with a merry grin, I can't get out but I won't give in. I'll just swim around until my strength is spent, and then I will die with the more content. Bravely he swam till it did seem his struggling began to churn the cream. On top of the butter he at last he stepped, and out of the bowl at last he leapt. What of the moral tis easily found? If you can't get out keep swimming around (laughs) ladies and gentlemen I present to you a challenge if you can't get out keep swimming around I'm telling you the Lord will provide a way the Lord will provide a way the Lord will provide a way not always your way but always a way his way Four. remain faithful in your character Joseph was morally pure. How easy it would have been for him to give in to the seductive advances of Potiphar's wife when obviously a woman who was his boss, older than he, tried to seduce him to come into her bed and he refused. How could he do such a thing to his master? How could he do such a thing to his God? They had to make up, she had to make up lies about him. That's what Potiphar's wife did. And he paid the price of prison for remaining faithful to his character. Don't let the pain on the outside taint or tarnish the character of Christ on the inside. Don't let the pain and pressure and hardship of the outside taint the character of Christ on the inside. It's been said that you don't really know what's inside a grape until you put the squeeze on it. And when the world and pain and hardship puts the squeeze on you, pray to God you have the courage and wisdom and His mercy in your life to let the character of Christ come out of you. Number five. Always forgive the offenders. Genesis 45, Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers. They are absolutely terrified that he will exact revenge upon them for selling him as a boy. But Joseph did just the opposite of revenge. He chose forgiveness toward his brothers. People will hurt you. 
That's a given. Sometimes they'll do it on purpose, but most of the time, they just don't know how to do better. And you will hurt people from time to time, and we don't do it on purpose, but we're just messed up. We're flawed. We are broken. That's why we need a Savior. And we have to forgive people. Whether they ask for it, whether they, they, they beg for it, we have to forgive them. And if they never ask, we have to forgive them because unforgiveness and bitterness will chain you to yesterday faster than anything I know. You may not like the situation. You don't have to like the situation, but you can learn to live with the situation and forgive those who've offended you. And forgive yourself if you've done the wrong. Now, here's what I want to make this statement. If somebody has hurt you deeply and you forgive them, whether, whether they ask or not, whether there's a conversation or not, when you forgive them, that doesn't mean that you have to hold hands with them the rest of your life and sing Kumbaya every day. Sometimes you forgive them and you go different directions. Friends, they're not bad. You're not bad. Well, we all, we're all lost in our sin. But they're, they're no less loved by God than you. And, and they don't deserve forgiveness, but neither do you. And yet God bestows freely upon all of us his forgiveness when we accept it. And so we should lavish forgiveness on others. So you may not be best friends. Through the years, through 30 years of the church, can you imagine those who might have disagreed with me or Leanne in some decision or some way we handled something and those who disagreed and we couldn't come to an agreement and, and they felt like I didn't measure up. If you've never sat in our seat or stood in this position, you, you've experienced the same thing at work, though. You've parted ways with somebody, but don't be bitter or angry about it. Don't, don't hold a grudge over them. Forgive them. Let them go their way. You go their way. And you know what? When we all stand before God, we're going to have to give an account. And you know what? I'll, how could I be judge of jewelry of anybody? I, I know me better than any of you know me. I know what runs through my mind that shouldn't run there. I know what's in my heart sometimes that shouldn't be there. God help me. Man, I've got me to worry of. I, I, can't, I can't throw them under the bus. I can't run them down or I can't hold a grudge over them. I just say, you know what? We disagree. And if they've hurt me or offended me, I'm going to forgive them. And if I've hurt them and I know it, I want to say I'm sorry. We don't have to be best friends, but please forgive me. And Man, that's a really good recipe to be to be right with the Lord and, and to focus on God and to move ahead in life and to move towards success. So forgive. Let, let's don't let bitterness ever take root. So let's sum this up today. Look at these five thoughts. Focus on God. Forget the past. Be fruitful in your work. Faithful in your character. Forgive the offenders. Forgive yourself. It's okay. God will forgive you. Who are we not to forgive ourselves if we have a God who forgives us? Look at this picture. Anybody that's over 18 probably knows who that is. Who is that? Abraham Lincoln. Man, what a great president. What a great president to see this nation through a horrific time of civil war and bring what should have been to bear. That all men are created equal under God. Thank God for Abraham Lincoln. You ever thought in your mind that I don't have a chance to be successful? I also read this about Abraham Lincoln, like the frog story. I read this probably 35 years ago. But it's worth, if you've heard it before, it's worth reading again. Based on Abraham Lincoln's past record of failures and hardships and heartaches... Abraham Lincoln had no right to think that he could win the presidency of the United States of America, much less do anything great while he was in that presidency. But he did not let the hurt or the hardship or the heartache keep him from trying. Listen to Abraham's track record, okay, as an adult. Listen to him. Listen to this. Failed in business at 21 years old. Was defeated in a legislative race at 22 Failed again in business at 24. Overcame death of his sweetheart at 26. Had a nervous breakdown at 27. Lost a congressional race at 34. Lost another congressional race at 36. Lost a senatorial race at 45. Failed in an effort to become vice president at 47. Lost a senatorial race at 47. Was elected as president of the United States of America at 52. Don't you ever... Let the devil 
put in your mind that your past determines your future. I'm telling you, not one in here probably could list those 8 or 10 or 12 major failures that Abraham Lincoln, and look how, look how he was used in the most dark season of our nation. Friends, God will use and can and will use all of us. And what we'll find a few years from now when we look back, and it was the pit and the prison, the dry well and the dark cell that prepared us for the work He has for us to do. Let's bow our heads.